The doors of the shuttle bay slowly close as Captain Kirk returns, with him a prisoner of great import. The shuttle is dim inside. Kirk, after finally escaping his pursuers, breathes a sigh of relief and looks back at his prisoner. Well then, Kirk, said Kor, you've done it now. What are you going to do with me? Kirk turns round and stands up from his seat, placing a hand on the shoulder of the Klingon warrior, now totally within his power. Whatever I want. That, ladies and gentlemen, was a reading from a Kirk and Kor gay love fan fiction. That exists, and that is my way of saying thank you for 25,000 subscribers. I hope you all enjoyed that little little gag. Uh, members will get access to uh, a full performance, I can assure you. Uh, but in any case, uh, thank you guys so much for 25,000 subscribers. And now, on with the show. Today we will be talking about how you can get ahead in Starfleet. And there's more than one way. So, yes, today we are going to be talking about career progression in Starfleet. This was actually suggested by uh, Navarc David Reeves, who suggested that I cover more people-related topics. He was the one who actually suggested I cover Jellicoe's shift patterns, and that did very well. In any case, it's worth saying right out the gate that Starfleet ranks and Starfleet promotions are incredibly inconsistent, especially when we get to the next generation. The fact that Riker is able to refuse promotion and block up the entire chain, which is even observed by Commander Shelby, the fact that Riker is able to do that shows that there is a fair amount of stagnation and corruption going on in the era of the next generation. So I won't really be covering that era because I don't think it's the best example. In this case, we'll be looking at the motion picture era, because it's a time when Starfleet was effectively on yellow alert. It was nominally at peace, but they were expecting to go to war at any minute, but they were not at war. So there's this balance between, you know, needing to do proper training, but also maintaining that readiness to go onto a war footing as soon as they have to. And so that's really the period we will be looking at in this particular video. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. So, you are joining Starfleet as an officer. Right, well, the first thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be going to the Academy, and you will be spending four years at the Academy. Now, most of the Americans in the audience will be saying, but of course. And most of the Brits will be absolutely horrified, because in Britain, the Royal Navy does not train you for four years to be an officer. It trains you for about 18 months. It's 18 months, it's divided into three terms, which is uh, militarization, marinization, and officerization. They don't have a good term for that last one, but you understand the expression. Whereas in Starfleet Academy, and indeed the US Naval Academy, it's obviously just a, essentially an alternative form of higher education. So there's a bit of a difference there. So basically, you will finish your time at the Academy at around 21, 22. You should be 21, 22 years old. And you will then be leaving as an ensign. As I say, it's very academic. It's very much oriented around producing well-rounded, um, well-educated and well-read officers beyond just their military duties. Now, this can visibly be dropped to 18 months as is with the Royal Navy. And that makes an awful lot of sense, and we do see evidence for this in Deep Space Nine specifically. I don't think we see Nog spend any longer than about 18 months at Starfleet Academy before he's back at Deep Space Nine getting experience, and then he gets a field commission as an ensign. And I'm going to guess that actually throughout the Dominion War, that was probably an extraordinarily common practice. So you start out as an ensign, uh, anyone who served will tell you that junior officers are still basically on probation. You'll spend two years as an ensign, and then after two years, you'll be promoted automatically to a sub-lieutenant. Now, in terms of how ensigns are assigned, 
ensigns are generally assigned to larger vessels. This is because, well, basically, you can keep an eye on them, and you want them to be learning from more experienced officers. You don't really want to trust them out on their own too much. So, as I say, it's very much a probation period, and you're really going to be called on as an ensign to supervise the more mundane aspects of life on a ship, like refueling, cargo transfers, and routine away missions where nothing much is going to happen. That's really the life of an ensign for their first two years. Now we get to sub-lieutenant, so this is after four years. It's not called sub-lieutenant, it's called lieutenant junior grade, which I think is a bit cruel, because it's basically saying, you could be a lieutenant, but you're not. You're junior grade. Whereas sub-lieutenant says from the outset, you're below lieutenant, but you're going to get there. So a lieutenant junior grade basically just means you've passed probation. And thus you can be involved in more key areas and you will be able to go on more dangerous away missions. You may be a department head on a smaller ship, but that's about it. And if you are quite exceptional, you could well actually be the executive officer of a gunboat, which I will get to. So after those two years as a sub-lieutenant, so this is now four years out in the fleet, you will have to go a lieutenant's exam. And this is basically to tell whether or not uh, you are up to kind of actual command or if you're just a lowly bureaucrat. It's worth noting in tapestry, of course, that the alternate Picard that Picard finishes up at is a lieutenant junior grade, which would mean he never passed the lieutenant test. Now, some of you will remember that in Star Trek 2009, Pike says to Kirk that you can have your own ship within eight years. Now, how on earth would you do that? Well, as a full lieutenant in the TMP era, you can get command of a gunboat, especially for the most sort of outgoing and uh, most talented officers. Those are the ones that they will be looking to put in command of gunboats. Not every lieutenant will get command of a gunboat, but the ones with the most gumption and initiative and capabilities, they will be put in command of gunboats. The examination that actually allows you to reach lieutenant is basically it's a collation of the last four years of your career plus your time at the academy those are collated together for your evaluation and then you're called on to do a practical exam which will test command abilities and decision making and that is essentially to discriminate between whether or not you are a a commander or a, a leader and there is a distinction there which we'll get on to further down the line but there's a distinction between between being a commander and a leader. So those who get top marks will get their first command on a gunboat. So these will be Oberth derivatives, Orca class, for example. And then from here onwards, promotions aren't necessarily as regular. But basically every two years, there will be a evaluation you will be looked at. And you basically get three strikes at each level. So... A total of six years you can potentially spend at each level. If after that third time you haven't uh, shown any ability, it's not that you won't get promoted, it's, it's that no one is looking to promote you any longer, and it's a very subtle hint to maybe just gracefully step out uh, because you probably don't have the right stuff and you need to make room for people who do. So now we move up to Lieutenant Commander, which you can reach as early as 10 years or up to 14 years. Now, this involves getting a lot more command assignments. This can be as part of uh, general staff. This can be as a squadron commander of gunboats. Or potentially, this can be as the commander of a destroyer. So that might be a Remora, a Chiazi, or Abe class. Now... It's worth mentioning that, again, they're going to look to distinguish between personalities. So, actually, a lot of the guys that were gunboat captains are probably quite suited to becoming destroyer captains. So, again, we have this delineation between uh, leadership and command ship. And so the ones who are sort of still engaging in leadership will end up being department heads on the largest ships and executive officers on medium vessels. This is kind of the first socially acceptable stop position because you are doing something valuable and you are holding a position of considerable responsibility. 
you know, it's people aren't going to look down on those that didn't make it past Lieutenant Commander because after Lieutenant Commander, it really is quite exceptional people who are going to be promoted and these are people who are going to put themselves out there and really distinguish themselves and show, you know, above and beyond levels of gumption, initiative and resourcefulness. So that brings us then to the full commander. To be a full commander, you need to be picked out uh, and it's really deemed as the start of the pathway up to higher command. You can reach commander at anywhere between 12 and 18 years of service. So you can become an executive officer on the largest vessels or you can be a captain of a frigate or light cruiser. So things like Miranda class or Larson class where you're being trusted to uh, go out further and only count on yourself. That's the real distinction between a lieutenant commander and a commander. A lieutenant commander is still ultimately a, a subordinate who is expected to carry out orders. A commander is someone who is genuinely expected to think on their feet and start demonstrating independent thinking at a much higher level. At the staff level, that's where they start becoming actually involved in decision making. Now, in terms of being promoted to a captain, there's really two routes. One is to be noticed by the Admiralty, that that guy, that guy is really putting himself out there, particularly if you're already commanding a ship, you're commanding a Miranda or a Larson, and you've done some very impressive things. The Admiralty is very likely to notice you there and say, right, let's make him a captain and let's put him on a bigger ship. Or if you're an executive officer, it's more likely that you will make captain after your current captain is promoted. It, this can be a quick way of achieving captain. It can be slow, depends on who your captain is and how much of a go-getter he is. And, you know, you do need to demonstrate that capability and confidence that, you know, they can just hand it over to you and you will know how to keep the ship running. So that brings us to captain, which you can reach within 14 to 22 years. And a captain is going to be in command of a heavy cruiser. So that's a constitution, that's a constellation, or an Andor class. They may also have squadron command over smaller vessels, and at the staff level, they will be heads of department. Anything above captains becomes more of a strategic and admin level job. And so there's again another distinction. We moved from uh, leadership to commandship to now strategic command which is a whole nother level. And that's, again, looking for a different kind of person. A department head on a ship is very different from someone who is expected to take command, as is someone who is expected to exert that higher level of strategic command, that big picture thinking. So that brings us to the last of the field ranks, and this one's a bit controversial, but it is indeed Commodore. This is the last field rank and you can reach it in 18 to 26 years. This represents a transition into the Admiralty. Now, unlike Admiralty, which are very much staff officers who are expected to hang back, Commodores are still kind of expected to get stuck in and be on the front lines with their ships. And so a Commodore will generally command a heavy cruiser squadron or a battleship, or a flagship, or other star bases. Now I say command, reality is, is actually they will be delegating most of the day-to-day -day commanding to most likely a commander, while they actually get on with the other relevant uh, duties. But they are out in the field. That is the definitive quality of Commodores. They are out in the field. They are not back at Starfleet headquarters. They are in the field, leading squadrons, leading battle groups making those battlefield decisions. And it's also quite interesting because Commodores actually feel themselves very much apart from the Admiralty. They don't like to view themselves as part of the Admiralty. They view themselves as really, you know, they're the admirals that get stuck in. They're the, they're the proper guys, you know, the guys who actually are up at staff level and beyond, you know, rear admirals, vice admirals, full admirals, fleet admirals. They're all stuffy bureaucrats, whereas Commodores, we're out here, we're getting stuck in, we're leading our men, we're showing an example to the officers under us. And that's, you know, that's how Commodores view themselves. Now, from here, we move beyond Commodore into the full admirals, and we start to enter the impenetrable bureaucracy 
of Admiralty, which I won't get into because it's very complex and very difficult to understand. And for most people, is not really anything that they are interested in. Once you move up to Admiralty, you are fully into that strategic command level of of thinking and working. You know, you are no longer engaged in leadership and you are no longer engaged in commandship. So, as I say, this is a rough outline and there are bound to be exceptions. And definitely this structure does not perform very well in the 24th century. It's very visible that there is stagnation going on in the Starfleet of the 24th century. The original series movies also kind of frustrate me a little bit. Not because of the lack of promotions, indeed. The, the crew of the Enterprise are all very, very decorated and and high-ranking officers. What bothers me is that they're all on the bridge of one ship. You've got two captains, you've got multiple commanders, and they're all on the bridge of one ship. No! Spread those out! Get them, get them out to the fleet where they can do some good and share their knowledge and experience. Don't just cram them onto one ship. You don't want so many eggs on one basket, but Anyway, I digress. That's a that's a minor quibble. The key thing is that the the this structure starts to delineate between leadership, command ship, and strategic command. Leadership is a department head, effectively. You are working with a group of people who you will know very, very well. You know what their capabilities are, you know what their specialities are, you know what their weaknesses are, and you can organize and set your department to work in a certain way. Command ship is a little bit different. You're going to have a kind of a higher level understanding. You're not going to know the ins and outs of every department. You'll know your departments and you'll know their capabilities and you'll know the people who are running them, but you don't necessarily know who, who they're actually commanding. It's a very different level of authority because it's not necessarily an authority based off of knowing the person and them knowing you. There's a lot more trust involved and there's an awful lot more kind of, that's where the real, the je ne sais quoi of command comes in. You know, that that ability to, to, to give an order and for people to just snap to it without thinking. That is really what Starfleet is looking for in commanders, in people in those command positions, is their ability to take charge of a situation and make those decisions on their own. And then finally, of course, we see the start of that strategic level of command where you're meant to demonstrate a higher awareness and an understanding of where you fit into the bigger picture. And then you're not so much involved with the day-to-day -day running of the ship. At that point, you are much more involved with those higher levels of operation and understanding where you fit in and where your command fits in to the bigger strategic picture. And then you're going again up into the Admiralty where that's even more the case. And so those are my thoughts on ranks and career advancement in Starfleet. Again, as I say, this is mostly aimed at the original series and motion picture era. I think there's a lot of shenanigans, but this is a good model of understanding how Starfleet operates. And again, why different characters are potentially at different places in Starfleet's hierarchy. And you can also then see just quite how stagnant and corrupt the uh, the rank structure is by the 24th century because they're not under that pressure of actually needing to move competent people through the structure to get them to where they need to be. Think about young hotshots like Shelby. So in, in this kind of time period, a young hotshot like Shelby get her on a gunboat, get her leading a gunboat as quickly as possible because we want to see what she's made of. She's got all this fire and zeal and, and piss and vinegar. Right, let's see what she's about. Let's put her on a gunboat. You know, how does she operate? How does she, you know, respond to being as part of a squadron? You know, is she a bit unpredictable? Can we trust her with a destroyer? You know, can we trust her to operate as part of a larger force? You know, can we trust her with a frigate, maybe? You know, these are all the questions that you're asking. And then you've got the people on the other track, on that sort of leadership track, where it's like, okay, well, how do they run their departments? How's the morale of the people under them? How do they motivate people? You know, you're looking there at two different paths. Both can lead to the captaincy, but they just go in slightly different directions. And, you know, chances are the, the Shelby type, you know, they can be quite tactically minded and that's great but that's not much use at the strategic level whereas the the leadership 
if they're really good at organizing things and understanding the department where it's like well hmm okay this is interesting can they apply this at a at a strategic level can they understand how ships fit into squadrons and squadrons fit into battle groups and how the different strengths and weaknesses of these units work together and you know where these could be best used you start looking again in those two kind of tracks for who can you pull up that's my uh, summary of starfleet ranks and Starfleet promotions and career progression in Starfleet and how it actually works and what it's ultimately trying to accomplish. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Leave your thoughts in the comments below and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members for supporting the channel. My loyal Navarks, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, Rella and David Reeves. My dutiful commanders, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, Nicholas Walsh, JC Tech Wizard, Rizel 3D, and James C. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, John Nicole, Athy's Collection, Tobias Klein, Greg Martin, and Shermos. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.